Hey there, good evening. It's Sunday night. Hope everybody's had a good week. We're going to give people a little bit of a chance to get here before we start things up. It's been raining and thundering, so if this thing goes off for some unknown reason, then yeah, you know the known reason is I probably had a power outage. A lot of crazy weather, a lot of hot places in one part of the country, uh, a lot of rain, a lot of cool spots in the country too. This weather is weird. But I think we'll be okay. Hello to everybody that's coming in. Hope you guys are having a good Memorial Day weekend. And that you're getting to hang out with your family. All of my family lives out of state. So it's kind of hard to get together at this time of year. But that's okay. And while we're waiting for more people to get here, I encourage you, if you want to, to make a run to the fridge and get yourself an adult beverage. Tonight, once again, we're drinking sweet tea with lemon and uh, Seagram 7 bourbon. Oh, yeah, I got just the right amount of bourbon in there. Holy crap. All right. Looks like we're starting to get a little bit more people coming in. Tonight is Leaves Discussions number four. Oh my gosh, we're moving up the, the ladder there. We're on number four. And uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about Do You Believe in Magic? It's one of the things that's a hallmark of being a pagan of any, any sort. Whether you're Wiccan, Norse, Druid, whatever. Uh... For the most part, that's one of the hallmarks uh, that's kind of a, a, a calling card for who and what we are. So tonight we're going to talk about the idea of do you believe in magic? I'm going to tell you why I do. And we're going to talk about a lot of things about magic itself to kind of give you some ideas of, of how to think about magic whenever you're getting ready to actually work it. And all kinds of stuff. So yeah, we're going to have some good... Good discussion tonight. It's Sunday. I ain't going anywhere. Uh, at least I'm not going anywhere where we've got uh, thunder and flooding and all this other crap that could possibly happen here this weekend. So I will be okay, and I hope you guys will be okay too where you're at. And uh, if you guys can hear me, give me a little type out. Give me a yell. Say yeah. If I need to adjust the... Uh, volume I'll do that because I want everybody to have a good shot at being able to hear and participate and enjoy the evening all right we're starting to get a few more people in here very cool all right well what we're gonna do is like what we do for everything whether it's a class or this we're gonna take just a minute here and we're gonna let the uh, get the energy kind of up on things you know after it's been all this kind of uh, rain and, and just all this other crap that's been going on where I'm at and stuff. So we kind of need to level that out a little bit and get ourselves set for the discussion for the evening. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit back and close our eyes and we're going to chant the all in three times. And then we'll get into tonight's discussion. Um, all, also, uh, uh, we've got a lot of things coming up during the week. I've had some things that are coming on now so it's like yeah we got a lot to talk about tonight but anyway we're going to close our eyes take a couple of deep breaths Oh. Uh... 
May the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. Uh, ooh, looks like we got almost 15 people here. That's very cool. I hope you guys are doing good. Um, you know, we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about the Druid movement. We talked about a bunch of different things that deal with uh, pagan traditions and stuff like that over the time that we've been doing classes and that we've been doing this uh, uh, oak leaves discussions. And it always goes back to, you know, the one thing that uh, a lot of people don't think about whenever they think about the traditions that we practice. And one of those big things is the M word, magic. And it's like, it's just like, we'll just take this discussion and take it back all the way back to before I started learning and, and you know, practicing anything to deal with paganism. Um, for me, the closest thing that I ever had to anything to do with magic was the idea of seeing things on Saturday morning cartoons. You know, the little wizard with his hand shooting the ray out of his, you know, the ray out of his hands and uh, various superheroes and, and magical beings on TV shows shooting eye beams out of their eyes and all of this other stuff. So, um, you know, and, and TV shows and things like that that were fantasized or, you know, just kind of put there to the idea that magic is just, you know, something to sell toys, you know. Uh, even when I started playing D&D &D back in the day, uh, right after everything got big in the 70s when we started playing D&D, &D, what's the first thing that happened? And there came out a TV show about a group of kids that fell down into a magical uh, uh, roller coaster ride and they end up in a land of, of, of fairies and, and, and witches and all this other stuff and they're fighting against a guy who is magical. His name is Venger. And what did that do? Well, for one, that sold a lot of D&D &D books, uh, box sets and everything. It was basically a marketing ploy to get more people to uh, buy stuff, you know? So it's just like back in the day, you, you know, we didn't really know better. Now, I will qualify that statement by the idea of there are people that have had uh, mystical and and magical confrontations uh, with various things during their life that had nothing to do with that. And I'm talking kids. I'm talking people that were preteen even, and and myself. And I'll tell you a story about that here in a minute. But it's like so for the most part. Other than what we see, the fanciful side of magic on TV and in media, we don't know. We don't know from a hole in the ground. We don't know what it is, except for those rare times whenever a magical situation or whatever um, touches us, that comes into our sphere of existence. And one of those things that about that is the fact that, for the most part, Whenever you look at it now, you can say that that was a magical experience or, you know, just something like that. Um, but back then, you know, whenever you experienced it, you didn't know what it was. Um, you didn't know what to call it. And it, a lot of times it scared the shit out of you. You didn't know. You didn't know what it was. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a time. Ooh, all right. We're starting to get some more people in there. Hello, everybody. Hello, to everybody that's coming in. Um, there was a time when I was young. I was about 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old, and I was here where I live in Missouri. I was in the northern part of the state, up by Kansas City. And this was in the 70s. This was back in the time of bell bottoms and bowl haircuts and, and uh, you know, sodas out of the soda machine were like 15 cents and all that stuff. But um, there was a time when my old man was starting to get some money. He was busting his ass, getting as much hours as he could at work, and the house that we lived in was eh, kind of a junker, and some of this stuff, and he's going, well, you know, uh, and my mom and him had been going to different places looking for new houses, uh, something for them to, you know, to be able to move us because we were a good-sized family, you know, there was five of us, and he wanted, you know, to move us into a better place, so 
he goes, well, let's go check out some stuff. And we went to this place way out in the boonies, like out in the country, like far out in the country. And this place was built uh, on a river. It's called the North Platte. It was the uh, just outside of St. Joe, Missouri. Actually, a few, several miles outside of St. Joe, Missouri. It was called the North Platte. And there was a house that was sitting right on the, on the river there, right on some property that was next to the river. And across this broken bridge, like you literally, you couldn't drive across it because it had been washed out. So you have one side river and then the other side of the bridge, which they had been talking about fixing it and all this other stuff. And we walked over there to that bridge, by the way. And that river was large enough that it was always fast. It was never a slow moving river. Now this house was a kind of a Victorian style home. Um, it was built in the early 1800s. Um, it was in very good shape. It was two stories, almost three, almost had a third story to it. Um, very large front deck with uh, side porches that were screened in and everything. And it was said that inside of this house, uh, there was a family that lived there. And then eventually after the family had the kids and moved out and everything, that the woman, uh, her husband had died. And that she had finished out living her life there with her sister. So we went out there to this place and we took a truckload of, of stuff because we figured, you know, we might as well start taking things out there. The old man was, you know, pretty well bent on getting this place. And uh, we went in and uh, it was just like it was it was like it had been left the way it was whenever um the people lived there so in other words there was a lot of furniture that was still there from the early 1900s um th at that time the uh, electrical fixtures were they weren't even you know this was 1970 1971 the electrical fixtures and everything were still from the 30s and 40s and everything uh, went into the kitchen the kitchen still had dishes and you know uh you know, condiment boxes and all of this stuff. And they had, if you would have been a, uh, 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 a picker, you could have gone through this house and made thousands. That's how, you know, old this place was. And the old man, my mom didn't like it, but my old man brought his gun. He had a Ruger and he was out there taking shots at beer cans and stuff. He was, you know, because this place had a huge yard. And all I remember was there was tons and tons of bunny rabbits and tons of toads. There were like more toads in that yard and around that river than I ever seen in my life. But we had to carry stuff into the house and whatever. And one thing that I noticed, and my mom figured that, you know, that one of us had to fill it too. But we were in this house and we were there for the day. And, um... I went in there and you could tell, I don't know if any of you have ever had any experiences with ghosts. I think ghost experiences are another form of magic, of energy, that kind of thing. So we go in there, everything's cool. But for me, I just picked up on something that, you know, I picked up on two people being there in that house. And you would go into various, down various hallways and look into bedrooms and bathrooms and stuff. Because this house was pretty big. And I wasn't scared. I was apprehensive. I just there I just didn't like it. Okay. So um I didn't tell my mom about this until like years later. But at that time, my mom my mom's one of these people that is very receptive to things she's a christian but she knows that i'm pagan she knows that i started as a witch she knows that i'm druid and all these other things she still wishes that i would be christian because she says she wants to see me in heaven she doesn't believe that i'll be in heaven she thinks i'm going to hell but that's a whole nother thing but she still at least she's halfway on the other side she believes in tarot she'll go to psychic mediums and all these other things and she's always been like that Oh, hey, all right. We've got almost 30 people here. Good to have you guys here tonight. But 
so after we go into this place about a week later my mom had had a a uh, meeting with one of the local tarot readers there in St. Joe and I think that she said that back then the reading for her was an hour and it cost her twelve dollars and fifty cents and the woman made her a cup of tea and they sat in her kitchen and the woman pulled out the cards and it was just a little beat up Rider weight deck wasn't nothing fancy the woman wasn't you know she's just a regular person that just happened to have a really good knowledge in working with the tarot itself and uh, you know she 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 uh, read the cards for my mom and she told the mom my mom some things about us boys me and my brothers and then she uh, she told you know she told my mom about some things with my with my old man and what was going on with him and the job and she asked her she goes okay but what about the place that we want to move into hmm, excuse me and this woman told her straight up I can make recommendations and the recommendation that I would make is not to move in there and my mom asked why um, would you uh, why would we not move in there and she goes because there's a body of water there and mom didn't tell her that the North Platte River was there and she goes well what about the river and she goes you you could have something happen with your boys and we were boys we were roughhousable all the time we were ornery we were always getting into trouble so anything was possible so we were set to try to get ready to close on the house and uh, my old man was going to take some days off and get some friends out there to help him clean up all the old stuff that was in there so that we could have room for ours and one night uh, he had a day off and they go in there to bed and my mom told me about this um, and this was after she had had her tarot reading and she's in there and she's cuddled up to him and she puts her head on his chest and she starts bawling just loses it and he's going what Carolyn what's around what's wrong my mom's name's Carolyn what's wrong why are you crying and she goes she goes I'm scared and he goes what are you scared of and she goes well I, you know I went to the tarot reading this last week and he goes yeah was it fun she goes no it wasn't fun and he goes what do you mean she goes the woman said that if we move into this place something could happen to the boys which is me and my brothers and he goes well like and this is he's this is happening like within a week afterwards so it's still it's kind of late um, but mom just you know she ruminated on it and kind of kept it to herself but um, he she's still bawling just losing it right there and he goes well what what do you want and he, she goes I don't want to move in there I'm afraid that one of the boys will die or a couple of all of the boys could die she didn't know but she goes I don't want to move in there and so, you know, sometimes men can be, uh, you know, just stubborn or whatever. But he could tell mom was terrified. And so he goes, all right, cool. We haven't given him any. We can get our $1,500 down payment back. And we can do all this other stuff. And we'll go get another place, which we ended up getting another place. We ended up getting a 1,200 square foot house with a backyard for $19,500. And this was in 1971. So think about that. That's a good price for that big of a house. But, um, you know, that was the first inclinations of anything magical with us. That was with me experiencing that. And it seemed like there were, they were old ladies that were looking at me while I was going through the house. And you could smell. And the reason why I know that I have connections to spirits is because back then even though it's not just the idea of being watched but another thing that ah, excuse me that came up with this um, ow, 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 was uh, at various places in this house I would smell like old 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 timey perfume it wasn't Brut by Fabergé or it wasn't any of the Estee Lauder stuff that women wore at that time it was like old perfume from the 1920s and 30s 
and in certain spots it would be cold in a room or in a hallway and when you got into these cold spots it would emanate with this you know with the smells of this perfume and I didn't like I mean I didn't it didn't make me want to pee my pants or anything but at that age of nine or ten or close to ten it's like you just kind of freak out you know you don't necessarily know and like one of the things that kind of got me thinking about that was around that time I don't know how many are, are that are with me or this old but back then there used to be a TV show on that came on every Friday night with uh, uh, Sean Cassidy and I can't think of the guy that played his brother but there was a show called the Hardy Boys Mysteries and they were always looking for ghosts and some of all this other stuff so back in the 70s you know there was that kind of a vibe of you know uh, uh, you know things that were con that were considered magical and so I didn't know what it was and at that time I you know, to say, do you believe in magic then? I don't know. I was a kid. I was a little kid. Okay. So I couldn't say one way or another, yes or no, if magic was real or not. Okay. And I'm one of those people that I lump magic into everything because of the fact that magic isn't just the result of an action that we do when we work ritual or a spell. I believe that magic is inherent and just the energy itself whenever you start the thought to do magic you're doing it until you stop until you get the desired result of whatever it is that you're doing so the minute you think it is the minute it starts okay so I went through many many years of troubles and things that went on with my family and I go through you know, the teenage years, the angst, running away, getting in trouble with the law, whatever. And I, you know, I didn't have that much of a worldview. I was a pretty much a pain in the butt. I, you know, we're all that for our parents at some point or another. But then uh, in the eight, late 80s, early 90s, I started to meet people that were involved into it a little bit more. And I'm talking about people that were that were involved in Wicca, uh, others that were involved in non-Wiccan witchcraft, people that were involved in Levian Satanism, and all these other things. And it's just like when I start meeting these people, it was just like the floodgates of thought of thinking just started opening up because I never knew any of this from 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 any angle. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what to think of it, but then people started telling me, well, this and that and the other thing, and telling me about authors and telling me about situations and studies of things that were done. Because, um, you know, back then, uh, at some point, there's always, even in the 60s, there were people that were demonologists or ghost hunters or parapsychologists. So the fascination with the occult and energy and magic and ritual has been with us for hundreds and hundreds of years you know whether you're studying it or whether you're practicing it you know you've got both sides of the equation there and personally holy crap we're almost 40 people well welcome to everybody that's coming in great to have you guys here uh, thumbs up love you guys I appreciate you hanging out with me tonight for tonight's Oak Leaf discussions Number four, do you believe in magic? Um, so I started to learn. And, you know, before I learned, there's always that skeptical thing. Now, raise your hands if you're, or give me a thumbs up if you were a skeptic before you kind of started studying, you know, your magical tradition or your, your pagan path. You didn't know. You thought it was all bunk and hokum and, you know, somebody was just pulling your leg. Well, I used to be that same way, but I'm not that way now because of, you know, various uh, um, situations that I've gone through that have just been too, too many things and things that I've seen and stuff that I've experienced, too many things that knitted together that weren't, weren't 
of the normal normal side of existence, weren't of the normal part of this world that we live in. So when you're dealing with stuff that is outside the realm of normality, you kind of have to look at the possibility of magical phenomenon, something going on. And in the early 90s, 1990, 91, I started to look into things. I started talking to more people. And this was before I dealt with my very first ritual or anything like that. And um, I'm dealing with people that are doing tarot readings for me, which I've never had a reading for me before. Um, you know, people telling me about them being Satanists, which I'm, you know, I didn't really get into that. I still really don't get into that. But, you know, so there's just all these different things. And I didn't know what it was because... You got to also think, the other thing is around this time I was trying to find myself, okay? And throughout my whole life, I've been, my parents never forced religion on me. But I had friends in school that I, I knew that were religious. I had friends that lived across the street from us for five years that were Mormon. Um, I had a friend of mine that his father was a Methodist minister, so I went to his church for various times during the year and things like that and then as I grew older um, I came into contact with charismatic and Pentecostalism uh, as a matter of fact um, yes I've been in part of the Assemblies of God but my original first Christian church after I quote unquote got saved was the uh, Church of God Cleveland Tennessee and if you've ever heard of the Church of God Cleveland Tennessee or you haven't they were the first Pentecostal denomination in the United States way back in the late 20s, 30s, and 40s that um, started the idea of snake handling. These are the ones that dance around the church with handfuls of rattlesnakes. And the reason why that they do it is because they say that the Bible says that you can take up serpents and drink any uh, deadly poison and the Lord will... Uh, you know, deliver you from death, you know, that you won't be affected by that. Holy crap, awesome, more people coming in, good to have you guys here. So, when you're in that mindset, the idea of magic, immediately, you know, the Christian side of you goes, oh, that's of the devil, you know, and everything, because, you know, if you, any of you are gamers, you remember in the 80s, the idea of the satanic panic, oh my god. My mom even kind of buy, bought into that. We would play D&D at our house and with cousins and friends and family and stuff like that. And at that time, the idea of the satanic panic was that uh, these churches believed that if you played D&D, you were practicing magic spells and you were summoning Satan and you were killing babies. And we did all of this stuff. And all it was was a, a furor over an idea of a role-playing game. All D&D is, if you've ever played it, is uh, uh, kind of like an acting theater troupe with dice. That's all it is. We're not going out eating babies or you know summoning Satan or any of these other things. We're just having a few hours of fun in our imagination. Um, and now D&D is one of the biggest things around the world. There are actors, big-name actors, that are playing D&D and what have you so you know it's, it's, it's become more accepted but back then the satanic panic there were people that were taking kids' books away and having d, &D burning parties where these churches would get all the kids monster manuals and dungeon master guides and all of their dice and all of these figurines and stuff and they would just pile them up out in the parking lots and um, burn them like they did records after Alan Freed Coined, coined the term uh, rock and roll. You know, there were churches that were uh, burning Elvis records and all these other things. So they did the same thing with Dungeons and Dragons because they were afraid of magic, that the kids were going to start summoning demons and all these kinds of things. But I don't think anybody ever did out of a D&D game. It's just, you know. But, but there was that mindset. So whenever you have that in your head, and then you've, you, you, you don't know yourself spiritually, so you latch on to the first thing 
that you can uh, get into, which for me was the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, Charismatic Pentecostal Church. Um, and one of the things, if you look at it as an example, uh, and that people don't think about this, is you got two people standing side by side. You have a pagan standing at their altar, working a ritual to make it, you know, to, to make it more plausible to reign, okay? And then you have a Christian standing next to you with their hands folded in the prayer position, eyes closed, speaking in tongues, praying for the Lord to send rain to end the drought. Okay, two people, different sides of the coin. You want to know something? They're both working magic. Prayers are spells. They are incantations sent from you, from your lips, because you're speaking, speaking a thing into existence, as we know, is what helps to manifest magical energy. So when we're standing over here, waving our athame and lighting the candles and doing these different things, then you have a Christian or a Catholic standing or kneeling with the rosary in their hand, praying to God. It's the same stuff, different day. It's a different form of magic. Okay? Um, but they don't see it like that. Of course, you know, that's just the way that that's going to be. But it is. It is manipulating energy to get a desired end, which is rain or to end a drought. And you never think about that. You didn't at that time. I never thought about Christian prayer as being a form of, of of magical energy, but it is. Praying in tongues is a magical form of energy. Uh, you know, being under the influence of the Holy Spirit in in Christian church and in, in, in Pentecostalism. It's the same, same thing as ecstatic dance. Whenever you are at a pagan festival or a ritual, when you drum and the rhythm and the beat and the sound and the energy starts to build up into you and you dance in an ecstatic trance state. It's the same thing. It's just two different sides of the same coin. And so back then, I didn't really understand that until... Um, I started to, you know, learn a, learn a bit, little bit more about it. And one of the things that kind of brought me into that realm of, of kind of understanding magic a little bit more was in 1992, um, I had a friend call me at a friend's house, another friend's house, my best friend and still my best friend at, to this day. Got a call and a group that we knew from another best friend of mine who's since passed away said, hey, we're getting together at Busick um, here next week and we're having a festival called Beltane. And what we want to do is invite you guys to come and hang out for the weekend, bring you some tent, bring your tents, sleeping bags if you want. If not, you can just come for the night and hang out with us. So, having never dealt with anything other than maybe a tarot reading in my life, other than, you know, the stuff that I had gone through for years as a Pentecostal and stuff, it's like, okay, so we figured out, all right, well, we'll go check it out. And when we did go check it out, um, there's the parking lot of the, the camping area that we were at, and then you look out across the, the grounds there towards this wooded area with a, a stream and some other stuff and there was a large group of people about 40 or 50 people in a circle and in standing in that circle was a uh, older woman and a younger man that were the priest and priestess of the ritual and there were people there with drums and there was a bale fire and all of this stuff and they are chanting and dancing and they're going around in circles and doing this stuff. And me and my friend are sitting up on the hood of the car watching this happen, okay? And one of the things that I think that kind of primed the pump for me was sitting there and watching it. At first, um, whenever you come from, I don't know about your experience, but coming from a background of being a Christian and coming into paganism, and just so you know, I've been pagan longer now than I ever was a Christian, so I'm very happy about that. But I'm sitting there watching this scene unfold in front of me, and at first, 
a little bit of me was starting to go, okay, are they going to eat a baby? That's the first thing that popped into my head. Are they going to, you know, somebody going to bring a baby forward and put it on the altar? You know, like how many of us have seen Rosemary's Baby and all of this other stuff? It's just like that fanciful kind of thing. I was just waiting. I was kind of, my gut was turning like, is this what's going to happen? But then about halfway through the ritual, they started doing some other things and the energy changed just the way it was there and the way it was up where I was sitting on the car. And the thing about that was, is I'm watching and instead of being an abject terror, I'm watching this and I'm going, whoa, what the hell is this? You know, that light bulb was starting to go off over the top of my head and it just, they're, they're doing their thing. And then they are doing a, uh, dance where they're trying to do a cone of power. It's the very first time because they had somebody that was sick. So they said that they normally don't work that kind of magic at belting, but they had somebody that was important to them that was sick at the time. So they did a little bit of a energy raise to help them feel better and stuff. And so I'm seeing these people dancing faster and faster and faster around this bale fire. Um, some in various stages of dress, robed, and some people not so robed. And old, young, guys, girls, that was, it was a mix of people there. And I'd never seen this before. And the thing that started to happen to me, it was like some of the energy that they were raising was starting to get flung out from where they were and up to me. I was starting to kind of like vibe with what they were doing. I was starting to feel it. And I'm going, oh, wow. And I wasn't, I wasn't afraid anymore. I was just like... I was, I was, you know, just really engaged in what they were doing. I was just like, you know, I've never seen this before. And then it's over with. Um, they, they, you know, do their cakes and ale. They drink. They eat a little bit. And then they dismiss the circle. Marry me, marry part until we marry meet again. Cool. Everybody hugs. And then my best friend at that time and his wife, come stumbling up to the deep grass, up to the car, and they go, well, I didn't think you guys would make it. And we, I, I go, well, yeah, I told you we'd make it because he was the one who invited us. And uh, I go, wow, that ritual was a trip. And he goes, you like that, huh? And I go, I thought you guys were going to eat babies. And he just, his wife shakes his head. No, dude, we don't eat babies. That's not what we do. And uh, he goes, are you going to come down and hang out with us? And I go, well, what's up? And she goes, we've got a camp area further down with a bonfire and everybody's got tents i think there's some leftover food from dinner and everybody's going to go down there and drink mead and bullshit and do whatever and i go well what are you guys going to do and he goes well me and my wife are designated as the uh the uh, queen of the may and her consort so we have to go consummate the the ritual and I go, what? And his wife goes, he's going to get some. I'm going, oh, because I didn't know the fertility aspects of paganism. I just, you know, whatever. And she kind of smiled and they kind of, you know, flounced away and went and did their thing. And we went down there to the camp area and sat around on logs. And they had built this really big bonfire. Uh, there was kids. There was older adults, younger adults. And we're sitting there, and this large cup gets passed around. And in this cup is my very first swig of strawberry mead. Oh, my God. It was beautiful. And the high priestess's daughter um, kind of comes over, and she's sitting next to us. And she goes, well, what did you guys think of that? And I told her. I, my best friend, he's sitting there. He's going, it was kind of weird to me. And he just, you know, was, went off talking to somebody else. And I'm talking to her, and I'm going, well, to be honest, at the beginning, I was waiting to see if you guys were going to eat a baby or anything like that. And she just kind of laughed. She goes, no, man, we don't, we don't do that. And her mother was the high priestess of the ritual. And um, I go, but I go, I'm down here with you guys tonight because I kind of want to learn about this. What is it? And she, I said, what is Beltane? Because I, I didn't even take the time to look up what Beltane was before I came to the event because I just wanted, I thought it would be a nice show and I might talk to people for a few minutes and that would be it. 
But I go, really, what is it? And she explained, and then her mom came over, and, and she kind of explained it a little bit. And I went, oh, it's fertility, pagans, and, and you know, uh, all this other stuff. And she goes, yeah, that's what it is. And I go, wow, I mean, this is just something totally new to me. And that right there was my first blush, blush, my first brush with magic, okay? And I liked it. It wasn't an addicting thing or anything like that. Everybody, people think that you're going to get addicted to it. Only stupid people get addicted to the power of magic. But not saying that there haven't been people that have been like that. But I go, so how do I learn more about this stuff? And people were going, oh, well, you do this. There were some books, and people recommended Scott Cunningham. Scott Cunningham's Wicca for the Solitary, uh, Solitary Practitioner, was the very first book that I bought myself. My second book that I ever bought for myself was Raymond Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft, Big Blue, which I was so lucky to be able to interview Raymond Buckland before he died. I used to have a, a talk show. And I got to talk to him about how Big Blue came to be. But so, you know, the standard stuff that people tell you about from Llewellyn and other authors to learn about it. And his her mother goes, but, you know, we do this, this and this here in town. We have classes. We do drummings and we do it at my house. And I live over on so and so. And so I started going and I started attending drummings and I started to attend classes and the thing was, it's just like, you kind of start like this, you're closed up, you don't understand anything, but the more that you take the time to learn, you open up, and you become more receptive, and that's what happened to me, okay? Um, and when I became more receptive, I don't know about you folks, but what happened was, it's like, okay, I'm learning it, now I want to do it. And that's the one thing, it's like I've taught in classes before and all this stuff. People get afraid of magic. They are afraid to do it. They go, well, if I do it wrong, I'm afraid that I'll burn the house down or I'll summon a demon into the house or whatever. And it's like, as with any kind of operation or any kind of, of situation where things that need to be done with great care are there, yes, you don't just do magic on a lark. You don't get drunk. And go down to the crossroads and summon Legba because you want to be able to play the guitar as the best in the world. You do stuff like that and you're going to get what you pay for because you're not taking the magic seriously. Um, you know, you can do magic in fun ways, but magic has a purpose. So, I think that over the time that I studied, and that's one of the big things that you kind of have to, you have to learn you have to learn about the mechanics of magic. And as you learn about the mechanics of magic, you learn about the reality of magic. Because then you start to actually do it. And then when you start to actually do it, you realize that you're practicing. And one of the things about practicing magic, holy crap, we've got almost 75 people here. Glad to have you guys here. Um, so whenever you're practicing magic, it's practice. It's what you're doing. You're trying to improve and get better at it to the point of eventually, whenever you're working a magical operation, that you get the desired effect. Okay? And I will say this. I don't know about you folks, but magic's not 100%. There's been so many times that I have done a magical operation over and over and over and over and varied the operation. Still did that over and over and over that sometimes the energy that you put out to try to get an, a desired result doesn't happen, okay? And that's the one thing that people that are not pagan look down on us for because they are programmed by Sabrina the Witch and The Craft and all of these other shows that they've seen on TV that they think any pagan should be able to just go down to the grocery store buy a lottery ticket and be worth $300 million by the end of the week because magic, yo, you should be able to win the lottery. Well, uh, people that practice magic, that really take the time to understand it, realize that it's a, not a one-sided thing. There's a two-sided thing to it, and it's called magic and ethics. People that have no ethics 
are the ones that are going to be practicing that magic, wanting that $300 million payout from the lottery. People with ethics can still want that $300 million, but whenever they put the effort into working the magic to do it, are going to realize that, you know, it's going to come to a point where one of two things is going to happen. Either A, the magical operation is going to be so strong that you're going to get what you want. Or B, you are actually three possible outcomes. Either A, you're going to get what you want. B, you're not going to get what you want. Or C, you're going to get what you want, but it's going to come with consequences. And that's true. Anything that you do magically, you need to be able to understand what the process is going to be after you've worked it. Okay, so you work magic um, and you put out there that you want a girlfriend, okay? And this is the thing that we always talk about in paganism, love spells. Well, the thing about love spells is if you're unscrupulous and you don't take ethics into consideration, what you're going to do is you're going to do a spell or a ritual to gain the love of a certain person, okay? And whenever you do that ritual or that magic or that spell to gain the love of that certain person, there is a possibility um, that you can do that. Now, the only way that you're not going to have that happen is if you're over here doing all of this work and putting all this energy to get them to love you, but whenever you interact with them, you demean them, you yell at them, you just do all this stuff. You're just a total ass. And if you're a total ass, ain't no magic in the world going to get you what you want in the realm of love. Unless that's one of these girls that just loves bad boys so much that they overlook that. But that's a woman's prerogative. A woman's going to love who she's going to love. But looking at the realm of not doing it with any kind of ethics behind it. So you're doing this magical working to get Susan to love you, okay? Yeah, Susan out. She goes, cool, yeah, we'll go out. Um, all this stuff. Eventually you get together, you hook up, you might have sex a few times, and things are going great. And, um, you know, she becomes more and more attached to you and all of that. Um, but then again, all of a sudden, you know, sometimes men that are undesirable at a certain point, once they start to... Um, you know, come into their own with one woman can attract others. So in other words, if you've got one girlfriend and somebody sees you with this girl and they go, oh, well, he's out with Susan. Um, I never really thought it in uh, that he had it in him. I wonder about this, this, and this, you know, maybe I should go talk to him sometime. So now you've got Susan that you did the ritual for to get her to be, you know, your girlfriend or your upcoming wife or whatever it is that you want. And then somebody else sees this, okay? Then they start putting their nose into your situation, okay? Um, it could be one of those deals where Susan becomes so attached to you and so jealous that it becomes like... Um, That, that, that she becomes unbearable like she, you can't you can't go over here you can't talk to anybody you can't do this because of the fact that you know you did the you did the juju to get her into your life that she becomes jealous and overbearing and possessive and things like that and eventually it makes you miserable because you just wanted her to love you and stuff but you didn't take into account that other factors can happen and come along and screw the pooch to the point where eventually, you know, Susan could do something physical to you, try to, you know, take you out. I mean, I, people have been murdered for less. Love triangles have gotten people killed in the past. So you have the idea of Susan getting pissed off that you're talking to all these other women and it makes her think that you're not as devoted to her as you should be. So that whole situation becomes a mess, okay? Now you take love spells with an ethical bent. And ethics means, okay, you're doing the ritual, you have everything set up, and what you want to do is you visualize the ideal woman that you think, 
you visualize, uh, and not just the idea of a physical appearance, although that is part of it, but you do visualize the physical appearance because that gives you a, a starting point. But the one thing is you, you look for qualities that you want to imbue in the person that you come in, in, in contact with. Like my thing is I'm looking for someone that is outgoing. I'm looking for someone that is pagan. I'm looking for someone that is uh, a lover of nature, somebody that's not really a homebody, um, enjoys, you know, music and literature and just all these different things. So you add these things to your wish list and you make them known in the spell or ritual that you're putting together to bring the, the type of people into your situation. Now, you know, considering, and this is where you, you figure out, do you believe in magic and, and stuff like that, is the idea that one thing that I believe whenever you take ethics into, into being, whenever you work any kind of magical operation, is the fact that you give yourself room for a better result. As an example of that, I did do a little bit of a love ritual years ago, and um, it didn't get me into a love triangle, but because I'm poly, and there's very, uh, very new movement in paganism, holy cow, we've got almost 85 people, good to have you guys here, um, you know, more people are polyamorous, and there was at one point where I was involved, sort of-ish, with three different women and it was and it was after this working that I did that the one thing that I noticed about the time that I spent with them uh, in those years was that each one of them didn't embody every point that I had put into the ritual or the spell or whatever it was that I had worked but each one took up certain parts themselves the next one took up a different area that they were more attuned to. So they were all three in their own way encapsulating what I was looking for in my perfect woman. Okay? And around this time, around that time, I had also been initiated into the coven that I was with, Greenleaf, here in Springfield. And that's whenever you realize, especially after you're initiated into uh, a, a tradition, you kind of start to realize your eyes are opened. You realize that there is more to the world than what we see on the surface. And that everything that's underneath the surface is the magical energy that's there for any of us to tap into. Now, that right there is whenever you have that realization is the idea for... Um, the idea that, yes, I believe in magic. I believe in the idea of, you know, that you can put out something to the gods in the universe, a question or a, a, a request that you would like to have fulfilled in some form or another and have them or the universe itself answer back with some kind of response. And with that, after that, uh, Love ritual, I did have a response. Um, the one thing about belief in magic is the idea that it's not going to be like what you see on TV. It's not going to be the deal of, uh, it can be, not saying that it hasn't ever been in our existence, but it's not going to be like you're watching Sabrina the Teenage Witch or Bewitched from back in the 70s or I Dream of Jeannie and you're going to wrinkle your nose or snap your fingers or whatever these things that they did, and something's going to happen, uh, you know, sparks are going to fly or whatever. Although they can, and I will tell you a story about that here in just a minute. Um, I think you know magic exists whenever you work it and you get results. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people, like I said before, are scared. Oh, I'm afraid to do magic. I'm afraid I'm going to screw it up. And all this other stuff, I'm afraid I'll burn the house down from the candles and all this other stuff. I think a lot of times that's just people who are, who are just so shy that they can't get beyond themselves, for one thing. 
or they just want instant gratification to the point where they don't want to take uh, uh, action for their own self. Uh, so that's like for me, whenever I work magic for people, my rule is that I'm not doing magic for you. I'm doing magic with you because I show you how to take care of yourself. Because the simple thing is magic is a personal thing. The energy that I would put into a spell or ritual for you is not the same type of energy that you would put in for yourself. Okay, even for your healing and things like that, family members and stuff. It's like you can't, I mean, I can help you. If you request it, I will do my best to help you. Um, you know, putting my energy towards a ritual or whatever. But whenever it comes down to the bottom line is you want to be able to help people. Um, by, by pushing the buttons here on, on uh, Facebook, I'm just going to put this out, uh, out there. With a thumbs up, send it up to me. Here's a question that I have for you guys. Do you believe in magic? Just that simple. You know, in, in whatever situations that you've been in, pagan-wise, uh, ritual-wise, throughout your life, how you've done things or whatever, do you believe in magic? Do you uh, believe that it exists? Do you believe that it functions? And do you believe that it has the capacity to bring you the things that uh, you or others that are close to you would want? Because for me, I will say that, yes, I believe in it. Um, and there's more reasons why. We're going to talk about that now. I don't know how many here, how many of you here have uh, in the past uh, been involved in the pagan movement. And it's like whenever I was younger, I haven't been able to go so much now, definitely not now with the pandemic going on. But in my earlier years, oh my God, I went to a lot of different pagan festivals. And one of the biggest and just one of the most fun ones close to me is a festival in McLeod, Kansas called Heartland. Heartland Pagan Festival is put on every year on Beltane Weekend. It goes from a Thursday to a Monday. It's either the weekend of Beltane or it's usually, if they can't get it to where it fits right, you know, with the days, they'll do it the week before. And it's just, oh my God, so many cool people. Um, it's, it's incredible. And... One of the things, one of the highlights of the festival for me, it's not the idea, you know, that, you know, uh, there's people there, there's vendors, oh my God, so much stuff for sale and what have you, but the people and the ritual and just the, the, the other thing for me, most important and most fun things are drummings. Oh, I have, well, I have a drum over here in the corner. And at that time, I had a couple hand drums and two tall, red, tomato-colored um, congas on stands that I would take with and would set them up at the drum circle. And here's the thing, another thing that I think that sometimes magic is inherent in the earth that comes from the earth and comes from the gods. You don't have to ask for it to have it happen. Let's put it that way. An example of this is there was one night that uh, it seemed like every time that I ever went to Heartland, the weather would be great for a little bit, and then eventually a rainstorm would come through. And it would rain and rain, and people would be stuck in their tents. And then just about a little bit before evening time, the rain would stop, and people could come out and do the things that they wanted to do. Think Woodstock. Think the grounds being torn up like Woodstock because there's so many people there and they're walking around and doing whatever so we have people that were there that were fire tenders that would go get fresh dry wood that they had stocked so that they could keep it ready for whenever we did drummings in the evenings and we're talking piles of cut tree stumps that were 15 to 20 feet high in a diameter of like 25 feet all the way around very tall, very wide. And you've got about uh, 65 to 70 people sitting in chairs on one side of the fire uh, with their drums and guitars and flutes and all of that. And then everybody else that was around the fire were just people 
dancers, uh, you know, just people, okay? And drumming, for me, is magic because it puts you in tune with the energy of the earth. That heartbeat, that heartbeat beat, whenever you're beating on the drums, you can feel that. You can feel it in your chest. And if you ever sit in your backyard and just sit there with your drum in your lap and just listen to your heart for a minute and listen to how that heartbeat sounds and you start tapping that drum exactly the same way that your heart is beating, that's magic because then you realize this is where we came from. You know, we came from the earth. We came from the dirt below my feet. And you just get going and you get going and you get going. Well, when you've got 70 people that are sitting there with you in various, uh, you know, with their various drums and things like that, and you get a good beat going and you get people in sync, then you get the dancers going, okay? And we had young girls, we had old men, we had every shape and size and description of people dancing around the circle, dancing around that fire, leaping and all these things, well, for one, you kind of start to get into trance. That energy of the drums and the energy of the footfalls of the dancers, you start to sway and you start to move as you drum, and you can just you can just feel it building. The energy of two and three hundred people standing around a bonfire, you can feel it. Well, this particular night, we're doing this and everything, and I am drumming and I open my eyes because a lot of times I'll just close my eyes and just feel what the drumming is and I looked up and I just looked above and right above all of our heads at about a height of maybe 10 feet above us was this silvery gray radiant kind of cloud of just of just fluff that just hung over everybody there at that drum circle. It didn't really extend to too much beyond out into other areas of the campgrounds, but it was right there over us, okay? And we had people that are dancing with zills, the little click symbols. We've got people that are belly dancing with swords on their heads. Um, we've got beautiful Zoptic pagan women with tresses of hair down to their ass in hippie skirts just swaying and moving and just dancing and leaping and going around the circle and it's like we're going and there's this beat that we get on and I'm not paying attention to the, the dancers so much and it's just like they become a blur and we kind of change the beat but it was still kind of within the rhythm of what we were doing and a guy behind me starts tapping me in the back and he goes, look, dude, look. And coming out of from one part of the fire that was kind of close to us, the people that were dancing there had danced so hard and so much that they had big puddles of mud like Woodstock right there around that outer edge of the fire. And people were still able to dance around and jump and, and do whatever. But it was just like there. So you have these flickering, crackling things of fire coming off of the bonfire that's right there in front of us. And you could smell that earth smell from the from the dirt being churned up and, you know, being made into mud. And as he pointed at me, he said, look over there. One of those Zoftig uh, pagan hippie girls had been down in the mud you couldn't see her she was basically covered in the mud you couldn't see her for a minute but then at one point in the beat she just raises up just fast and standing there before i don't know if any of you have seen the image of the village of vilda the venus of willendorf the faceless heavy breasted uh, goddess figure that has been, you know, through antiquities, it's the most famous representation of a goddess form that any pagan can know. But this girl just had the hair mudded and matted down. Her face was covered in mud. Her clothes were just, just slick. And she's just dancing. 
and more people are starting to dance with her and you look off in the distance behind her and with everybody that's around her as she's dancing and I'm drumming and the fire is still going but I notice that as they're going around the circle right above the tops of their heads are about six inch plumes of blue fire on everyone not just the dancers but those that were were off to the side and even to the drummers that were on my side and I'm assuming there was probably one above my head and it just lasted for a couple minutes you know just the dancing and that whole beat was going on and that blue flame that was above everybody's heads but then as things kind of you know calm down you look up and that plume of fog that wonderful silver gray night time sky magical fog it just kind of dissipated and then the fire left and we had a beautiful awesome night after that that is i believe that was the goddess coming to say hello um and giving us just a taste of what you know we weren't necessarily you know making any calls we were doing various goddess chants and stuff sure but we were chanting all kinds of things that wasn't just directed at one certain deal because each of the beats that we were drumming to was a different thing. It was just we were having fun. But I, I tell you this to say this, that magic also doesn't have to be something that you focus on, okay? It's not something that you're just going to, you know, okay, I have to get up and I have to get candles and oils and incenses and all this stuff to do magic. You don't need things to do magic. Sometimes you can do magic with just a song or with a recitation of a poem or just, you know, thinking. You know, that's our ultimate goal is to eventually not need the things that are considered crutches to do magical work. You know, we should be able to go out into the woods, talk to the goddess, make our request known, talk to the gods, talk to our people, talk to the fae, talk to whoever, and put those things out there that, you know, uh, we need a little something. And it's not a matter of, uh, the one thing about also with the ethical side of magic, we don't want to be selfish. You know, it's like everybody that, that thinks, well, which should be able to just go out and win $300 million instantly from the, you know, the Powerball or whatever. Okay, so we got $300 million. What are we going to do with it? You know, are we going to take it with us when we die? You know? Uh, who are we going to take care of? Who are we going to help? If I win $300, $300 million, I'm taking care of my best friend. I'm taking care of a bunch of my friends here in Springfield. Take care of my friends out there in Internet land because I've got some friends that I've known in real life that I only have access to them through the Internet now. And they're going through some hard times and stuff like that. My goal is after all of that to have just enough to you know take care of myself live for the rest of my life comfortably, maybe get an area where I could build a druidic refuge so that after I die, that can be left to, to others to use in perpetuity. But it's not like the idea of, okay, you have to use magic to be selfish. I don't want to be selfish with how I do magic. I you know some people do, and that's on them, and I can't say anything about it because of the simple fact that with the belief in magic comes the belief in consequences. If you do good things and you do good magic, you're going to get good consequences. And those consequences are going to carry out after, usually a good portion of the time, after you've worked that magical working and you've received the benefit of it, that there's going to be a little bit of a residual that's going to give you a... Uh, a good situation afterwards you know but on the other side of that if you do and this is the only thing is though like a lot of people the read that that magical stop button that everybody says ain't harm none do what thou will yes that's a big thing to it but here's the deal being a druid we don't necessarily follow the read for one reason and that one reason is I'm gonna take care of my people and the reason why that is I'm not gonna let you roll over my mom I'm not going to let you roll over my brothers or my aunts or my uncles or any of my friends because they didn't deserve to have that treatment wherever it is that you're treating them bad. So on, on the one side, you've got the, the witches and stuff that say, 
But no, you can't ever do harm to anybody. Now, outside of I'm not going to murder someone because that's against the law. But anything else that comes along that line, you know, that I could do magically uh, as far as a curse or whatever, that is something I will do. It is said that if a witch cannot curse, a witch can't heal. So that's, and that's folklore from way back. So that's, you know, that's a kind of a built-in ethical thing. But it's also the idea of, okay, if I'm dumb enough to do something so heinous and so stupid because somebody pissed me off, I need to be able to accept the consequences of whatever happens afterwards. If I get pissed off at a girlfriend for doing me wrong, and I get really vindictive and vicious with the curse that I throw on her, and I go out in the street one day and I get ran over by a car, and my arm gets broke real bad, that's my karma. I threw out a uh, curse that didn't need to be out there or it was a little too strong. Or, you know, sometimes the, the idea of not believing in, just the idea of believing in magic is knowing when to say no. And what that means is, okay, she screwed me over. She did this. She did that. My best friend, he did this. He did that. Sometimes you got to let it drop and not do a damn thing. If they're going to be that petty and that bad about trying to get over on you and do these stupid things, then you're not worth having in your life. Not even worth putting the energy into doing the magic in the first place. And, you know, um, so you have that aspect of it. It's like, how do you do your magic? If you believe in it, do you believe in it enough to be ethical with it? And then one of the last things that we'll talk about tonight for this juridic discussions is the idea of, you know, Sometimes we got to be selfless with our magic. And what that means is the idea of even before this pandemic, I mean, you guys have seen the, uh, you know, the earth is going through a lot with all of the wildfires that happened in Australia, the wildfires that have happened in California, flooding, uh, just all of these things. It's like we do so much magic for ourselves. What about putting some of that energy back into the Earth Mother itself? This is the planet that takes care of us. This is the only planet that we're riding on right now in the universe. Okay? And once it's destroyed, nothing else will be able to exist here if we go so far, if we go past that point of no return and destroy what she, her ability to take care of us. Um, that's part of what I think this pandemic is, is there are times that the earth doesn't, the earth doesn't need us. It allows us to be here. So being that mother that feeds us, that she can be also the mother that destroys us, just like Shiva, the, the, the destroyer and the giver of life. You have both sides of it. But it's like, that's one of the things so many pagans are so, you know, ready to dance around and do Beltane and Salon and all this other stuff. But how often do they do stuff for the earth? When was the last time you went out and planted a tree? How many of you have really good gardens? Oh, and thumbs up, fists up, pump bumps to everybody out there that's got gardens because uh, now's the time to really get those going because we don't know what the situation is going to be. And I think to be as healthy as we can, I think we're going to need gardens. So to all my pagan gardener friends out there, I give you guys a high five because you are the shit for now because of the simple fact that, you know, we got to be able to take care of ourselves. And I think one of the best things that you can do is grow a garden because not only will you take care of yourself, you take care of members of your immediate family that maybe don't live in the house with you. You can help take care of those neighbor, uh, you know, those neighborly people that have been friends with you for years. It's like, you know, we can show that we're pagan more than just wearing a, a black robe and a pentagram ring or a druid with a white robe and our Awin necklace or whatever. We got to take care of each other and we got to take care of the earth. That means taking care of the animals. Um, you know, we got so many people that are out there that are over hunting, over fishing, doing all these things so that eventually, do you realize that we have so many species? Of, of trees and plants and animals and, and beings that are going extinct every day, every minute. 
that we get so caught up in being pagan that we aren't pagan. You know, we don't send out the energy and say to the gods and to the universe, stop the extinction. Stop those people that are out there that are burning uh, eight football fields a second of the Amazon forest. The Amazon forest is the lungs of the world. Once that forest is completely burnt down, we're screwed. That's 25% of our uh, CO2 going up because trees scrub out CO2 and give us oxygen. So this is going to be bad. So for us pagans, it's up to us to do what we can physically, you know, to stop all this deforestation and stuff by planting trees and stuff like that. But because if we believe in magic, we need to practice it and put that energy out there and say to the gods, help us help the Earth Mother. Help us stop the destruction of these animal species. Help us stop the deforestation. Um, you know, help us stop the criminal diamond mining in Africa and all of these other things because we only have one planet for right now. And, you know, it's like I want to leave uh, this existence to somebody else and have them not have to struggle because they are, they can't breathe because of, uh, you know, bad air quality. They can't live because their water can't be drunk like Flint, Michigan. How many years has it been? Seven years and Flint, Michigan is still having dirty water that is so full of lead and mercury and things like that that it's killing people. You know, so that's what pagans are supposed to do. If we believe in magic, we need to utilize it and not just for reasons that are selfish. We need to be selfless and help people. You know, that's what I think, you know, um, everybody's idea of magic. And the other thing is just like on the on the closer to home things. You know, working magic with our pets, taking care of our pets, being advocates for our pets. I mean, you know, one of my biggest hates being in Missouri, I hate Missouri because we're the leader in the world of having the most renegade puppy mills. I hate puppy mills. Don't buy puppies. Uh, you know, if you find a breeder that is legitimate with the AKC and has all of the backgrounds and all of that stuff, that's fine. You know, you do you, boo boo. But as far as buying puppy mill puppies, that is so bad. I mean, I think puppy mills need to be shut down and all the puppies need to be taken. Moms and dads and all the other little dogs that are there need to be brought to no-kill shelters and put at a reduced price. The only thing that you should pay for, and even that at a reduced price, you shouldn't have to pay for the animal. You should be uh, go through a check to make sure that you are capable and able to, to love and take care of that pet. And be able to, you know, provide it a home. But, you know, these places that are charging $300 and $400 just because that dog might have a breed and it might be a King Charles or whatever. I think that they should charge just enough to recoup what they need to do for spay and neuters. Because spay and neuters can be more expensive than the actual adoption fees at some of these, you know, no-kill shelters and stuff. Here we have five shelters. We have one kill shelter, which is huge. And four no-kill shelters. But, so, if you're out there and you're looking for a pet, the next time that comes around, please talk to the gods. See what you want. It's a kitty. It's a puppy. Whatever you want, adopt. Tell your family and friends to adopt. You're saving the life of an animal that more than likely has had the most hellacious existence up until that time. And you're helping to kind of, you know, put the put the put the notion out there that, you know, that these puppy mills and things like that are bad. They're not good. And there's kitty mills too. There's people out there doing some of these really fancy breeds. So it's like and you know, just putting magic out towards them like and magic isn't just an operation of where you're standing around a uh, you know an altar and stuff. Magic can be simply going to your bedroom pulling out a stick of incense, putting it into the incense burner, and lighting a candle, and saying, I hope a puppy mill gets closed tonight. I hope that these people that are doing these mean things to animals around the country 
get their justice. And you just did a simple spell, and most people are going to be heartfelt with that because we don't like to see animals suffer. <laughs> and now I'm getting weepy. But I, I am. I hate seeing animals suffer. It pisses me off, you know. And also, we need to be uh, more advocates for, you know, like people that deal with, you know, child uh, uh, abuse and spousal abuse and all this. There's magic that we can do that makes a difference. That's basically what I'm saying about that. Holy crap, we've got almost 130 people here. It's Sunday night. We're having druidic discussions. Oak Leaves 4. Do you believe in magic? I hope you believe in magic. I hope you believe just a little bit more that we've been talking about that and listening to my experiences. Um, we're going to get ready to shut this down here in just a uh, few minutes, but give you guys some um, stuff that's coming up and coming on and coming around. Okay, today is Oak Leaves 4. We're talking about Do You Believe in Magic? I also do classes. The next class that we've got coming up is this Thursday at 7 p.m. And the subject for this week's class is Irish Celtic Animism. The idea that uh, the earth itself is sacred. The animals, the trees, the streams, the mountains, the oceans, everything. And that how the shamanistic side of Irish Celtic culture many, many moons ago and still to this day are the ones that saw the uh, magic of the deer uh, running through the forest away from the hunter, the hare uh, being chased by the other animals that were its predators and things like that. We look at that and see, you know, existence and nature working. But back then, that animistic side of it was a form of magic. It Because the people that were in those times didn't understand it. So we're going to talk about the gods. We're going to talk about their sacred animals. We're going to talk about druidic sacred animals, such as the crane, the hound, the boar, the salmon, all of these things because they tie into druidic practice. So we've got that coming up. We've got Oak Leafs 5 coming up, and we've got more classes. The next class, uh, uh, this is number 10. We're going to be doing number 11, not this week, but next week. We're going to start talking about the triads. <clears throat> no, we're not going to start. No, we will not start talking about the triads. We just got through this week doing Philodect and the Bardic Arts. The next class, after this class on animism, we're going to do a class on the Ovate Seer. We're going to talk about herb, druidic herbal magic, and we're going to talk about divination and seership and spell work as an ovate seer in Ireland in ancient times all the way up to now as druidic practitioners. So we've got that and we've got more oak leaves discussions coming up. Also, I want to say that uh, for those of you that are listening and have uh, never been a part of it, I invite you to come and check out our Facebook page here on uh, Facebook. It is Missouri Druid School. Hosted by the Order of the Standing Up, which is the Druid Order that I formed here in Springfield in the year 2000, 2000, 2001, early 2001. And um, if you have any questions about magic, if you have anything that you would like to let me know about your magical experience, what you think about it, feel free to toss me a message and let me know what you think. I am open to any kind of discussion, any kind of questions. Also... Um, we have something that is going a little bit deeper. Let me get a drink here. Oh, that bourbon is good. We have something called the Lore Keepers Course. And what the Lore Keepers Course is a deeper insight into Celtic studies than what I teach in our uh, classes that we've been doing on Thursday nights. And what these entail are audiovisual uh, components that I put together and I'm putting up on YouTube. And this is an actual course. This was uh, brought together by the Celtic Reconstructionist group Emmis and uh, by the uh, one of the heads of Emmis at that time, Alexi Kondriatov. 
and he is the author of the book The Apple Branch. It is a great uh, uh, introduction and one of my favorite books on Celtic ritual and Druidic thought. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 2011. So his course has been uh, 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 placed up in various spots on the internet. And what I'm doing is taking them and bringing them down into a form that anybody can have access to. And what this is, is I'm putting these videos together that are talking about uh, three different tracks of study. The first track is history and the history we're dealing with the first uh, sub point of that which is number one who are the Celts we have three tracks we have history language and reconstruction and we're gonna go through all of those so that you can get a little bit more in-depth look at the Celts um, how Celtic language influenced Druidic practice and then at the end of that with the reconstruction side how Druidry reconstruction Irish witchcraft, fairy faith, and all these other things have tied together to make a living, growing, pagan tradition around the world, not just in the United States, but all over. And if you are interested in being a part of this, and there's also actual work that you can do. There's are, there are worksheets that ask you multiple choice questions and essay questions that pertain to videos that were before it so that you can get an idea of what you are you are getting out of the course itself it's free it costs no money and there is no time frame you don't have to do anything at any one certain time you can do it when you want to do it but having said that if you are interested in being placed on the mailing list to get these uh, matter of fact I posted the the first uh, history track today which is history track one who were the Celts if you're interested in that message me with your workable usable email address I don't want something that's so you know important that you don't want people that you don't necessarily know to have it. just a regular email address that I can associate with you put it in there and weekly we're gonna get one or two parts of the course this is a big course it's going to go over time, but it gives you something a little bit more than the bare bones of what I do here on Facebook. And the reason why I do this, the bare bones here on Facebook, is because A, it's not going to hold anybody's interest if I go so deep that you can't understand anything of what I'm talking about. You give people the bullet points. You give them the things that are important to understand and begin their study in Celtic magic, uh, Irish uh, lore and the Druidic principles and things like that so that they can take those themselves and adapt them to their spiritual self. Everybody practices Druidry different and that's why I'm here is giving my take on it. There are so many different people out there but another thing is with this pandemic going on and different situations not very many people are actually out there teaching so that's why I'm doing this you know to give you guys the opportunity to you know experience it and do with it as you will and it's a it's an out, outlet for me to you know do what I want to do as a Druid priest and that's to be there for my people you guys out there my people you know in that in that in that pagan vein and the, my brothers and sisters of the earth kind of a vein so that's why we're doing what we're doing um, classes are going to be as they usually are 7 p.m this tonight was 7 p.m. We're going to keep on doing it. What I'm going to, going to do after we get through here in a couple minutes is I'm going to process this video and I'm going to uh, get it set up and put it on Facebook so that you guys can watch back um, that came in later. Holy crap, we got almost 145 people here. Thank you guys for hanging out. And uh, like I say, if you have any questions, friend me, join Missouri Druid School. We've got some great people in there. We've got a lot of stuff coming on the classes. The next class is Irish Celtic Animism this coming Thursday at 7 p.m. But before we get out of here, what we're going to do is kind of just bring it back to the beginning and do like we always do at the beginning of a class or, or a get-together. Is We're going to just kind of kick back, close our eyes, we're going to take some deep breaths, and we're going to chant the all-win three times. 
May the blessings of mind, body, and spirit be yours. I've had a great night. Give me some thumbs up. Let me know that you're out there. Um, and I hope that you guys have a great week. We've got a lot more stuff coming up. Um, I appreciate those that are here tonight. And keep an eye out because we've got a lot more stuff coming up. I'm going to go and fix me a late supper. We've got more rain coming in. We've got some flooding possible this week. So wherever you are this Memorial Day, Memorial Day weekend, be safe. Remember those who have fought and died for us to be able to hang out here on Facebook. And having said that, from the altar to the ring, may the gods bless you. And I will see you guys again this coming Thursday for class.